throughout the ages, people have rallied around many causes, and millions have died as a result of their belief. Fear has been a powerful tool used to persuade people to go to their death for a cause they may not have understood, but were led to believe in. Most of these causes ended in disastrous destruction. Monuments around the world stand today as a reminder of futile beliefs and vain ambitions. Each of these causes grabbed headlines in that generation, but each has passed away like a flickering light. Recent history in the nation of Madagascar reveals another tragic end in a stand for a cause. Although the world did not stand and take notice of these Malagasy events, History has recorded the fatal plight of those who stood and died for a cause. A cause that has stood the test of time. My name is Mike Francine. Arriving in the nation of Madagascar prior to our great campaign in the National Stadium where more than 100,000 people gathered, I was strongly impressed that we were entering into a harvest. I knew that others had labored and had sacrificed and had given part of their lives, and we came and we reaped a harvest, a hundred thousand packed into the stadium. But it has not always been like this. At this moment, I'm standing in a courtyard where barely more than a hundred years ago, a queen sentenced Christians to a gruesome death. In March of 1830, a landmark in the history of Christianity in Madagascar was achieved. The first New Testaments in the Malagasy language were printed. It was about this same time, however, another force in this land dawned. The coronation of Queen Ranavalona, who later would earn for herself the title of the Bloody Mary, was inaugurated. Shortly after the position of queen was bestowed upon her, six French war vessels landed on the shores of this small island country. This attack turned the government of the Malagasy people to appeal to the idols for protection. Superstitions were revived and diviners became the chief advisors to the queen. Queen Ranavalona embraced the worship of idols and the ancient practice of ancestor worship, and she fully expected her example to be followed by her loyal subjects in the land. Soldiers were gathered, cannons fired, and nearly 100,000 people gathered to hear the queen's proclamation. Her message declared first her confidence in the idols and her determination to continue the customs of her ancestors. She would treat as criminals all who refused to pay homage to the idols or who despised divination. As to baptisms, places of worship, and the Sabbath, who rules in this land? Is it not I who rule, stated the queen? These things are not our ancestral customs, therefore they are unlawful. A sentence of death was pronounced upon all Christians who would not renounce Christ and bow before the idols of the land. Although upon this decree many did turn from the faith, there were many others who would stand fast in their claim to Christ's salvation. The aggressive assault launched against the believers forced many into hiding. A cave at the base of a mountain provided refuge for a handful of early believers. Huddled together in prayer, a small group of Christians prayed for their fellow kinsmen. They were betrayed and discovered. Amongst this small band of believers was a young 17-year-old girl named Rasalam. Her death would be the first of a numerous train of martyrs who sealed their testimony for Christ with their blood. Queen Ranavalona vowed to rid the land of Christianity. This obsession led her on a bloody tirade which lasted 33 years. During this span, Christians were sentenced to gruesome deaths. Some were beheaded and their heads stuck upon poles so as to deter the spread of Christianity. Others were bound hand and foot, tied to a stake and set on fire. Some were speared, some forced to drink poison, while others were cut up into hundreds of small pieces. Many were tied up and hurled over a cliff to their deaths. 
The wicked queen resolved to ever-increasing measures to exterminate the gospel from this land. The queen, whose thirst for blood seemed to wax more fierce, now commanded the soldiers to bind the hand and feet of any Christians they arrested, dig a pit, cast them in, and pour boiling water upon them until they died. The blood of the martyrs had become the seed of the church. Arriving in the country of Madagascar, you're greeted with a sense of isolation. Even though this nation is the fourth largest island in the world, and is located just 250 miles off the east coast of Africa. The coral reefs of Madagascar boast incredible underwater beauty. A vast array of tropical fish and marine life lures divers from the world over. The orchids of this island are extremely varied, with more than 800 different species. The fantastic flora is a treasure for tourism here. Every year, this natural beauty captivates the photographers. The rolling contour and natural beauty of the land makes it easy to embrace. The people who are mostly of Indonesian descent post a carefree and kind demeanor in spite of the bloody past attached to this place. Madagascar is a mystical land with her own unique customs and history. Here are more than 300 species of plants, insects and animals that are found nowhere else in the world. The capital city, Antananarivo, is emerging from the time-honored ways of the past. Modernization and industry has brought this country into the 20th century. Quality factories and facilities have escalated exports, and the products produced are superior. Every year, excellent product comes forth from this land in ever-increasing quantities, and world markets are beginning to take notice. Once known only for her exports of vanilla, other industries now vie for a share in export profits. Intertwined within the modern-day technology are the relics of the past. For some, ox carts are still the only mode of transportation. Their livelihood still depends upon this cheap form of transport. Open markets remain as the life flow of the country. Daily, the vendors gather with their produce and people stream into these places to begin the bargaining process. Every daily essential can be purchased. Madagascar is emerging from the shadows of the past and is poised to make the transition into a brighter future. But she is still listed as one of the poorest countries in the world. Even though more than one million people live in Antananarivo, most of the country's 14 million people reside in the rural countrysides. Here, life is simple. Here, the needs are basic. Construction of a simple home is very time-consuming. But in village life, time is an abundant commodity. Brick by brick, piece by piece, the long process continues. Rice is a staple food of the Malagasy people. But the processing of these native-grown foods takes us back to lessons and methods that have been passed down for generations. Farmers work long days preparing the fields. No plows are used here, no oxen. Just primitive tools and a determination born out of necessity. The topsoil must be turned so as to assure a good crop. In this mountainous region, even getting water to the rice fields is laborious. Survival requires the ingenuity of these people. The tools and methods of their forefathers may be outdated by today's standards, but they still work and are dependent upon the man rather than his machinery. The rural existence bridges the ancient past to a promising future. Some fish, but often with little results. Others harvest crops of rice, corn, or carrots. Sometimes the yield is great, but the work is hard. Even though the land is rich in minerals and precious gems, agriculture still accounts for 80% of the island's exports. 
In Madagascar, deforestation runs rampant through the country. Today, only 15% of the original land cover remains. Each year, some 2,000 square kilometers of trees are destroyed. The impoverished of the land clear trees by slash and burn methods. Trees are cut for fuel or to make charcoal. The tragic byproduct of this is the erosion of the soil. Water, which is one of the basic and welcome necessities of life, becomes the destruction of the land when it contends with areas stripped of their trees. Precious topsoil is lost, and so is the future producing power of the land. <laughs> A hard life is etched out. That, coupled with inadequate medical service, has the average lifespan of a Malagasy person at just 52 years of age. Even with the dire problems many of these people face, they are a precious people. Their cultural heritage is rich. The lives lived in this land may bear the marks of a weathered life, but their faces and warmth welcome even strangers. The beauty and riches of this land go beyond what the eye beholds on the surface. Madagascar is rich in her cultural heritage, rich in her beauty and natural resources, and rich in precious, semi-precious stones and gold. Even though the land contains vast wealth, these gems are not exported on a wide scale. Leading-edge technology is not used, thus that which is obtained is minimal. Malagasy miners work in treacherous conditions, long hard hours, with archaic tools extracting the wealth from the earth. Mining families have carved caves out of the mountainsides that they call home. These nomadic gold diggers toil long days. This particular group may excavate $10 of gold a day, but divided amongst them all, it is a meager living. Prodded, picked, and panned, the few nuggets and dust gathered is then put in the fire and purified. Madagascar plays host to a variety of religions today, but most of the Malagasy people practice ancestor worship. Despite the various tribes, the country shares a common language and belief in the power of dead ancestors. To the people of this land, death is an important part of life. When a person abandons his mortal body, the Malagasy believe his spirit becomes a powerful and significant ancestor. Dead bodies may lay up on their beds for several days until the witch doctor decides which day is best for burial. These sorcerers are feared and respected by many of the people. These witch doctors are sought out by the local villagers and they determine when the bone turning ceremonies will take place. Every few years, dead ancestors are dug up from their graves or removed from the tombs. These family tombs may contain as many as 80 bodies. The remains of dead ancestors are exhumed. This is a grotesque and revolting scene to Western minds unfamiliar with this practice. In some cases, the bodies are only partially decomposed. As the corpses are removed, some celebrate, others lament. The bodies are re-wrapped in new cloth. Then close family members hold, embrace, and talk to the dead. The corpse is treated as though it were alive. The dead family member is shown new developments in the town as they paraded through the streets. After the festivities, they are paraded around the tombs, then laid back in their resting place. These dead ancestors are considered to be potent forces that will look after the surviving family members. If they are remembered by the living, they believe the spirits can be relied upon to look after their descendants, protect, bless, and honor them. The Word of God tells us that no one shall defile himself for a dead person among his people. The scriptures further instruct us to keep ourselves from idols, 
you shall have no other gods before me. From this very palace here in the nation of Madagascar, a little more than a hundred years ago, a wicked queen pronounced death upon Christians. If they refused to renounce their faith in Christ, they were put to death by, by many torturous ways. And their faith and their confidence and their love for Christ did not allow them to, to, uh, to face the queen and to bow at her name, but rather they faced death. Their martyrdom today stands as a remnant in this nation. From the north, south, east, and west, people from all walks of life attended the five-day campaign in the National Stadium. Rich and poor, the sick and the well mingled together. For many, it was the first time to hear the uncompromised Word of God. They would not gather to hear the words of religion. They had already walked that road. The religions they had tried offered no hope or help. Some came out of curiosity, some because of rumors of miracle reports. Others came because they had desperate needs, and others because they longed for the reality of God. In excess of 100,000 precious people flooded the huge stadium, filling it to capacity for the first time in the history of the nation. For five power-packed days, evangelist Mike Francine proclaimed Jesus as the Christ. He opened the campaign with this statement. With this proclamation, the stage was set. The theme of this crusade and every crusade the Francines have conducted around the world hung on a banner over the stage for all to see. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. With great passion and compassion, the evangelist preached the unchanging Christ. He is risen. He is alive today. The works and miracles we read about in the scriptures are the same things he will do today. He is no respecter of people, and because of this fact and the fact that he is alive today, he will meet your need right where you are. The huge audience gave full attention to every message. Most had never heard such bold statements. Most had never experienced the salvation of God. Every day, scores of people turned their lives to Jesus. They were convinced beyond doubt that Jesus Christ alone could forgive sin. What factors persuaded such a large number of people to accept Christ? It was the daily display of the miracle power of God. The miracles convinced the multitudes, just as they did in Bible days. Cripples hoisted their crutches overhead and walked. Scattered throughout the vast audience, you would hear outbreaks of joy as another miracle happened. Stretchers of previously paralyzed people were empty. Tumors dissolved. Deaf ears were opened. And Christ was glorified. A crowd of people adopted a song, which became the theme song for this campaign. Higher, higher, lift Jesus higher. Lower, lower, put Satan lower, was sung from the lips of the multitudes. For this is exactly what they had experienced this week. Jesus was lifted up before their eyes and, more importantly, in their hearts. The campaign was a huge victory for the host of heaven. The nation of Madagascar has experienced the living Christ. 
the martyrs who gave their lives for the cause of Christ did not die in vain. These are the miracles that touched the heart of a nation. These powerful miracles that took place during the opening days of the campaign were instrumental in the explosion in attendance and the vast harvest. I've been to the nations of the world. I've preached in country after country from Africa to Asia to South America. And every place I go, we preach a simple gospel. And when we proclaim the name of Christ, it is signs and wonders following that convinces the people and gives them that same kind of solid faith that those Christians stood for in, these, in this land and these grounds many years ago. I want to look at Matthew chapter 11. And I want to read to you just a few verses from this chapter. Matthew 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when they had heard the, in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you the coming one, or should we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. John the Baptist was there. He heard the works of Christ. He heard of the miracles and, and, and the, the different things, and he wanted to know, are you the Christ? Are you the one we seek? Are you the one we're looking for? Or should we look for another? So John sent two of his disciples, and he said, you go and you talk to this Jesus, and you ask him, are you the Christ? Are you the, the Savior? Are you the one that's coming? Or should we truly look for another? So two of John's disciples, they went to Jesus. And they came to him and they said, Jesus, art thou the Christ? Or should we look for another? And Jesus said this. He said, go and tell John the things that you see and the things that you hear. He said, the blind see, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. Miracles are happening. The poor have the gospel preached to them. He said, a miracle settles the issue. I've had the privilege of proclaiming the gospel of Christ in nation after nation around the world. More than 52 nations of the world we've had the privilege of traveling to. And whenever we do, wherever we go, Christ confirms his word with signs following. The martyrs in this land were convinced beyond doubt that Jesus was the Son of God. The martyrs of this land were convinced, and they died for that faith. As we proclaim the gospel of Christ, we've seen God do the miracles. I remember a crusade in the nation of India. Thousands and thousands of people had gathered over the great field. And one man came. He was a staunch Hindu man. He came and he sat at the back of the crowd with his arms folded. And he says, I don't believe in this Jesus. I don't believe in what this man is saying. He said, I've been a Hindu all of my life. And he sat there. But for 18 years, this man was totally blind. His eyes did not see for 18 years. For 18 years, his, he saw no light. He saw no people. Total blindness. He sat at the back of our crowd. One of his friends brought him out of curiosity. He came to the crusade, and as I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, he sat in the back of that crowd with his arms folded and said, I don't believe. I don't believe that this is the Christ. I don't believe that he's the Son of God. But I preached Jesus. Jesus, in the Bible, he said, a miracle settles the issue. A miracle will convince the people, that a miracle will convince John that I am the Christ. Now here I sat and I preached in India. And this man, 18 years blind, sat there at the back of the crowd. I don't believe. As I began to pray, all of a sudden, he, told, he shared this testimony from the platform. As I prayed, he came up and he says, he said, when you prayed, my eyes were blind. And he said, all of a sudden, a bright light shone before me. And he said, Jesus stood before me. And he said, when Jesus stood before me, he said, I didn't even believe in him. But he said, when he stood before me, he reached out his hand and he said, I am Jesus be healed. And he said, then all of a sudden the bright light was gone and I opened my eyes and I could see. Well, this man, he came up on our platform in that stage in front of all those Hindus and those Muslims and all the different religions of the world. And he grabbed the microphone and he testified and he said, for 18 years, I've been blind. I didn't believe in this Jesus. I've been a Hindu. But he said, listen to me, Jesus opened my blinded eyes. He said, I believe on him now. You've got to believe on him too. And he preached a tremendous sermon. A miracle settles the issue. We've just finished our great campaign here in the city of Antananarivo in, in Madagascar. 100,000 people, more than 100,000, packed the great stadium. 
night after night after night, I stood up and I proclaimed the theme of a, of a banner that waved over the back of our stage, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The ch unchanging Christ never changes. And I preached that in this stadium. A hundred thousand people or more gathered. And the miracles. In Bible days, Jesus convinced the people through miracles. Blind. He said, tell John the things that you see and hear. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. And he said, that's your answer. For if, for if John wants to know if I'm the Christ, he said, a miracle settles the issue. And for the people of Madagascar, a miracle settled the issue. He is the unchanging Christ. Yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The miracles we read about in the Bible work today. The miracles we read about in the Bible happen today. Many people today look at this book as a history book. It's not a history book. It's living. It is the powerful, sharpened, two-edged sword, the Word of God. It is not a history book. That's been the theme of every crusade we've done around the world. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the nation of Madagascar, we preach that Jesus Christ is the, is the Son of the living God. It's not religions. I don't believe in religions. Religion is man, man's ideas of what God should be like. Religion is tradition. Religion is superstition. But God wants us to have a relationship with Him. And that comes only through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I, Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. In this Madagascar crusade, the miracles convince the multitudes. As we've seen in nation after nation after nation around the world, the miracles every time, they convince the multitudes that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. I believe as you watch these next few minutes that you too will be convinced that He is the Christ. Just as 100,000 people or more were convinced of Jesus' Lordship in the nation of Madagascar in the Antananarivo Crusade, I believe that you too will be convinced as you watch these miracles. As we preach the miracles, great joy filled this city. Great joy filled the stadium. Reports from the radios came because Jesus is the unchanging Christ. He never changes. There was great joy in this city. And I believe as the people here were convinced, you too will be convinced as you see what God done, as you see what He did and, and, and what the things that took place, your heart will be convinced of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. From martyrdom to miracles, Madagascar has turned to God in His favor, His love, His face has shone upon them. This man bore the emblems of his suffering for all to see. For years, his crippled legs could not bear the weight of his body without the crutches. In this crusade, Jesus touched him with miracle love. Now he carries the crutches that once carried him. This young girl's eyes had suffered the effects of cataracts. The disease had left her almost completely blind. After the evangelist prayed, her sight was restored. A miracle took place. It's true. It's truly a miracle, her friend testified, verifying the miracle. She counted fingers to prove to the crowd of her miracle. The audience cheered the mercy of Christ and the girl's newfound sight. Her left ear was totally deaf for more than two years. Her mother brought her to the crusade, and this day she received a miracle. The small watch was held next to the previous deaf ear. What do you hear, she was asked. Tick, 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 she repeated into the microphone. Once again, the unchanging Christ gives a miracle. Her mother testified with joy over what God had done. This 20-year-old man was thrilled with the miracle healing he received this day. He was born with crossed eyes and had been that way all of his life. Today, Jesus set his eyes straight for the first time, and his cousin was there to joyfully verify the miracle. She came at 8 o'clock in the morning to the stadium in anticipation of what she was believing God to do in her life. For many months, she carried a large tumor in her stomach. There were tears of joy as she realized her miracle this day. The tumor is gone. What seemed insignificant to some was powerful to her. A large tumor protruded from her ear. After prayer, she checked to see if God had truly done it in her body. The tumor is gone. Five months ago, I was in a terrible accident. 
My legs have been so swollen I could not even wear shoes. But today, Jesus healed me and took all the pain and swelling from my legs. This precious young Malagasy girl came to the campaign with hope of a miracle. She had a large tumor in her chest. She had been to the doctor and even brought her hospital admission papers for the upcoming surgery. The tumor had to be removed. During prayer for the sick, she laid her hand on the tumor. Suddenly, she felt her chest and the tumor was gone. With a thankful heart, her mother testified of his goodness. She had recently been to the doctor. He told me I would have to have surgery to remove this tumor, she stated. But today, when we prayed, the tumor instantly disappeared. He healed me. God really healed me. She was scheduled for surgery, but now this operation has been canceled. This 63-year-old woman was born deaf in her right ear. During prayer, she did what was instructed by the evangelist. She put her hand on the place where she wanted God to heal her. After prayer, she removed her hand, and to her amazement, the deaf ear could now hear the faintest whisper, Jesus has done it again. For nearly 20 years, this man carried a tumor the size of an orange in his stomach. With a thankful heart, he tells of his miracle. The tumor is gone. The large tumor in her right side was most painful. During prayer, she experienced the power of God as the pain and tumor completely left her body. <laughs> His left ear was deaf for years. After Mike prayed, he testified it was like a loudspeaker was turned on. Now he can repeat a whisper. The vast audience cheered the wonderful miracle. For more than two years, I had been dependent upon my crutches to walk. A bone disease left me crippled as hope was stripped from my life. After prayer, I felt the fire of God go through my body. I put down the crutches and walked. I'm a medical doctor and work with many people who have lost hope. I've always had faith that God would heal my husband. We attended the crusade. I prayed with all my heart that God would heal him. When it happened, my husband began to walk without the help of Christ. This 43-year-old man was born deaf in his right ear. The unchanging Christ brought his miracle and opened his deaf ear. Joyfully, he testified of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Suddenly, through the vast crowd, an empty stretcher was being passed overhead. Then, an elderly man and his wife came walking toward the platform with this amazing story. For many years, this man had been unable to walk or even stand. He was carried to the crusade in this bedridden state. He was in bed all the time. Even to get to the bathroom, they had to put him on a chair and slide the chair into the bathroom. I came craving for God, weeping, oh, please heal me today. I do trust you and believe you, and you will heal me today. I touched my legs during the prayer. Suddenly the pain was gone. I sat up, then I stood up. I could not do that for years. Jesus Christ touched his life with resurrection power. His wife wept with joy at the incredible miracle. They stood before the multitude, amazed and grateful for God's mercy as the crowd cheered them on. For two years, his crippled legs kept him bound to the crutches. Without them, he was unable to walk. During the prayer for the sick, he felt the power of God rush through his legs. He hoisted the sticks above his head and took off on a miracle walk for all to see. The crowd rejoiced at the astounding miracle that took place here. Prior to this miracle campaign, she was unable to walk. The unchanging Christ changed her future by healing her crippled legs. A stroke on his left side caused his arm and leg to be paralyzed. For 13 years, he was unable to move either. A miracle loosed him today, and now he can do what he previously could not do.
Antananarivo Crusade was a huge success. Thousands of people's lives have been changed. The martyrs of the cross did not die in vain. Their blood paved the way and stands as the seat of the church in Madagascar today. Thank you.